Okay, welcome everybody for this uh, preprint review challenge. Um, it's been a long wait, but we are here finally on the 22nd of September at Peer Review Week. Um, I'm really thrilled that there were so many of you who had an interest in uh, learning more and participating in the review and commenting of preprint. So thank you for being here. Um, what we are going to be uh, doing now is a brief introduction as to how things are going to run today, just so that to give you a, a, bit, a few pointers uh, around the platform and the format, etc. Um, but before I got, get onto that, I guess it's a reminder that the goal for today is that we want to uh, develop a large collection of comments and reviews of preprints, but not everything in life is uh, work. So hopefully you can also have a chance to meet some other uh, scientists with an interest in uh, open science and, and the latest research um, and have some fun in the process. So uh, before we get started, we are now in the stage uh, uh, area of the platform. I'm going to be going over several of the areas um, that we're going to be using. Uh, so you're here now. So this is the stage and this is where we are doing the presentations, etc. On the right hand side, you have the chat functionality. Uh, so when we get uh, to the presentations and uh, talks, etc., if you have any questions, you can use the chat functionality for the stage. Um, there is also the option of uh, the chat for the event. So this uh, gets posted for everybody. And each of the sessions, which I will speak in a second, have their uh, dedicated chats. Um, we have also opened a couple of polls, which should be next to the chat uh, functionality. So if you want to take a few seconds to, to take the polls, that would be great. We'll have some more later. Now, I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, uh, going over the sessions area, because this is where the reviews will happen. This is where uh, the conversations and the discussions and the writing of reviews will take place. Um, so if you check on the uh, toolbar on the left-hand side, just below the stage uh, icon, you will see the sessions icon. Um, this is where we have created different sessions. So it, it, they are similar to breakout rooms uh, on Zoom, if you want. Um, and they will open at five minutes past the hour. So they should be opening soon. And when they open, you will see a little label that says now, probably. Um, and what we suggest is that at, at five minutes past the hour, once those uh, get open, the facilitators for each of the uh, sessions that have groups will join the sessions. And you are free to uh, join those and get started if you want to get started on the reviews. Um, something else that I wanted to mention about the sessions, and I think I have uh, shared this with uh, several of you who signed up for today, is that we we had some preprints. Actually, we had a lot of preprint uh, great suggestions for preprints to review. Uh, but for some, we were not sure that we could actually create groups based on the expertise of those who signed up. So we have created a dedicated session to do um, essentially re writing reviews in a co-working style. Uh, that's what we are calling the multidisciplinary group because we're covering many disciplines. Um, so if you have a preprint that you prefer to work on and there is no dedicated session, you can just join there and do uh, your review on your own. Um, and something I, I, I'll mention around that is that if you join that session and actually find uh, some buddies who like uh, the same preprint, you can also create your own session in, if you like. So attendees can also open their own sessions or rooms to then uh, get working on reviews. Um, I'll at around 15 minutes to the end of the event, what we have done is that we will open um, separate uh, session where what we would like to do is invite you if you have finished your review at that point and are happy to join this to tell us a little bit as to how you find the format and the running of the event today was it useful did it help you uh, learn a little bit more about reviewing was there anything that was tricky you don't have to join this session uh, if you prefer to stay in your session and keep working on the review that's fine um, but i wanted to mention that i'll be there with uh, victoria Yan, who is um, our colleague from Mesa Bio, and we'll be having a chat about the experience uh, if you would like to join us. Uh, during the last few minutes of the event, I'll mention this briefly, this is optional, but I just wanted to mention that the networking area will open, and this is kind of for one-to-one um, -one, uh, quick chats, two to three minutes with other attendees. So if you want to try all that and see how it goes in terms of meeting others who were here today, 
you can join that session. Again, it will only open around 10 minutes before the end. Uh, so that covers the um, uh, the areas. The other thing I should uh, mention in terms of accessing your sessions is that there are links, direct links to each of the sessions in the uh, shared spreadsheet that has the list to the to each of the preprints. So if you're having any difficulties finding your session, essentially just go to the direct link and it should get you there directly. Uh, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention as we get actually doing the work on the reviews. Um, very briefly, we expect the work today, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to be in line with the ASA Bio Community Guidelines and Code of Conduct. So essentially, we want this to be a, a constructive and productive and fun experience for everybody. Um, we want to make sure that everyone is polite and constructive. So bear that in mind as you are discussing uh, preprints and your comments with others, be respectful. Uh, stay professional and again be, be uh, open-minded about the different viewpoints and perspectives and expertise that, that different of us uh, among us uh, will bring to the conversation. Uh, a couple of uh, now hopefully final reminders. Um, we are collecting the reviews through SRG Docs, which are uh, open mostly because we wanted to make it easy to, to share. So please do not tweet uh, the, the G Docs that we've served, mostly because there may be names about the attendees, etc. We will lock the G Docs after the event. Um, but essentially, we want to capture as much of the activity as possible. And I will be reviewing the, the activities so that we can then collate and tally a number as to how many reviews we did. And we can review that later. Um, we will. We are happy to post the comments on a public platform for you after the event. So if you have time today and you're working with a facilitator who can help you do that, please feel free to spend time posting that publicly. That would be fantastic. If you don't have time, that's also fine. No stress. We will review all of this afterwards, and Ace Bio will facilitate the posting. Um, okay, so very briefly, the sessions are now open. So if you want to join uh, the sessions, as I mentioned, that, that part will be open now and you can get going and meet other uh, colleagues to do your review. The other thing that we are running in parallel is that we're going to have this session, this area uh, here on the stage open for the next 20 minutes or so, because we have two great editors who are going to give us some advice and tips as to how to approach the screening and review of preprints. So if you join the event today, hoping to learn a little bit more about review generally, uh, and you would like to hear those tips before you get started, uh, please stay here. Um, this will run for around 20, 25 minutes. Uh, we are happy to take questions through the chat. So if you have any posts there and we'll keep a few minutes after the presentations to cover those. Um, obviously, if you stay on the uh, stage and then join the session later, just be mindful of, of the conversations that may have taken place before uh, you arrive. So just check the GDOC and see where they are and join them where they are. If anything comes up, the best uh, and you need any help, the best is to uh, use the chat to contact me, Jessica, or uh, Victoria. We will be keeping an eye on the chat, etc., and uh, we can help you if you need anything. OK, so with that, again, the sessions are open. So if you're ready to review, you can do so now. Um, and we are going to be moving on uh, here on the stage uh, with the discussion and, and presentations around the screening and review of preprints. So we have two great presenters. Maureen Neiman from the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Biological Sciences, and Tom Allenberger from Review Commons and Embo Press. Uh, so with this, I think we can start with you, Maureen. I'll stop sharing. Oh, I well, we cannot hear you for some reason. Oh. Okay, so maybe coming back, just trying that. Um, so, we'll, so we'll wait 20 seconds and see if she's back. Otherwise, maybe we can move on with uh, Toma. It's a tricky platform. <laughs> uh, 
as with everything new, it takes time to get used to. That's it. Lauren is here. Hello. Oh, perfect. No okay. worries. Thank um, you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Can you now see my screen? Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about how I have been working with the Royal Society of London and their flagship journal Proceedings B for the last uh, three years to develop a process by which we've been soliciting preprints for journal submission. And this began about three years ago when I was a new associate editor at Proceedings B and the journal was looking for an editor to take on a new role, which was preprint editor. And I was already very interested in preprints as somebody who felt like they were a very important and accessible way to distribute science around the world in an equitable manner and to uh, bypass or alleviate some of the issues associated with, with unfair or slow peer review. So I was very excited to take this on and I was, excited to get appointed. And then the, the journal said, you know, I said, how do I do it? And they said, well, it's up to you. We haven't done this before. So I was, I was actually given the opportunity to develop my own process, and which has actually been, I think, quite successful. So this has definitely been a team effort. Um, I, the co-authors on this talk are Dr. Dorota Pachesniak and Dr. Robin Bagley, who are both the associate editors for the preprint team. And they do a lot of the organizing and um, a lot of the great ideas have come from them, as well as some of, as well as some of the other team members. So, where our process begins with soliciting preprints for submission to Proceedings B is with a preprint server, and we decided very early on to just focus on one server, which is BioArchive. And we made that decision simply because there are a lot of preprints out there. This simplified the process for us, and thus far, it seems like. We are able to access a large fraction of the preprints that are likely of interest to us out there. So BioArchive is divided very nicely into a number of subject areas that span biology and um, Proceedings B also spans much of biology. So we are very interested in addressing a lot of these areas. And I'm showing you here the areas that uh, are covered in Proceedings B and in BioArchive where we're actually recruiting new members of the preprint editorial team um, marked with the star. So if you'd like to follow up um, during or after the talk, um, send me, you can write to me on Twitter, or you can email me or Dorota or uh, Robin to express your interest in any of these areas. So what happens next is then for each of these areas, we have a team leader who directs uh, the process of combing through these journal submissions with a number of other members. So typically, um, the team leader and the members work together within a subject area to identify a set of preprints that look like they could be a good fit for Proceedings B. So this happens, the preprint team looks through these subject areas. Um, currently we have 48 team members from 26 different institutions in 10 countries. So it really is a very broad and globally distributed effort. And I'm especially proud of the fact that a lot of these members, almost all of them, are early career researchers. So they're undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs, getting really, really great opportunities to interact with uh, publishing, editing, peer reviewing. These preprint team members um, from each of these subject areas then come back with a recommendation for each month of submissions to BioArchive. Um, we go with the most recent month, so we just finished August. And then I go through every one of these recommendations for solicitation. It's usually numbering close to 200. I go through them one by one, which is, uh, you know, a quite a, maybe an eight to 10 hour process for me at least. And I decide which of these suggestions to then go forward with the solicitation. All of this is collated on a collaborative monthly Google spreadsheet, which is um, color coded. I give uh, feedback to and from team members and they give feedback back to me. I explain why I did or didn't pick a preprint in particular so they can learn and refine their solicitation process. So then I send out an invitation to submit. Um, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a bit, but this is an email that is personalized according to the author's name and title. Uh, then the, it's up to the author. They can decide whether they then want to go ahead and submit this article for peer review. And of course, and then peer review happens and then the paper does or doesn't get published in Proceedings B. So I think we've, we've done quite a bit um, in 
is in these last few years in particular, I wanted to highlight the fact that we've had over 100 early career researchers who've been part of this team. Um, we're suggesting at least 125 or so preprints a month and often close to 200. I end up making about 50 emailed solicitations per month. We're getting between 15 to 30 or even more submissions per year. This does seem to be increasing. Um, in 2020 so far, we have 23 submissions that we solicited. 17 of them did get, um, go forward for review. Six of those were accepted. And it's important to note that these statistics are very similar to the peer review and acceptance rates of Proceedings B as a whole. So we feel like we're doing a good job of soliciting papers that are indeed a good fit for what Proceedings B would like to publish. The process has been praised um, by authors as well as editors. We're hearing a lot of positive feedback um, about solicitation and uh, about our use of the preprint server. We've gotten some really nice positive press coverage and our, our process has been viewed as effective enough that it's actually been adopted by other journals. Um, we also realized in the process of soliciting papers that we were often finding preprints that seemed like they would be a fantastic fit for Proceedings B, but Proceedings B didn't really have a place for them. And so this actually uh, inspired discussions that led to a brand new topical section in Proceedings B called Biological Sciences Practices, focusing on wider scientific practices within the biological sciences. I think this is incredibly timely in light of all of the interests um, in recent years, and especially in the last six months or so with respect to thinking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, challenges that biology, reviewing, and editing, and so on faces. And a, a nice example of a new article in the section that came about as a consequence of what we were learning about preprints came from Wood et al. 2020's article that was recently uh, published in Proceedings B, got a lot of, of press coverage about the lack of diversity of science, scientists and biology textbooks. So they showed that while um, in the United States, there's a very, very uh, diverse um, population, there's a really striking mismatch between aspiring scientists and the role models that get profiled as examples in biology textbooks. We have also though faced challenges, of course. Um, one of the earlier ones that we realized uh, was that the solicitation email, not surprisingly, could be perceived as spam. This led uh, us to develop a script that enabled us to personalize emails by author names and titles, um, which helps in making sure, of course, that um, the email really is professionally written. It's not perfect. There still are, I'm sure, a lot of authors out there who just automatically delete an email like that coming from us about potentially submitting a paper, even to a well-known journal like Proceedings B. We've also had some challenges where associate editors at Proceedings B are sometimes rejecting papers that we solicited without review for the perception of lack of fit to the journal. We've addressed this both by um, returning to these associate editors with the goals of solicitation of preprints, which in part were broadening the scope of Proceedings B to being more inclusive of more papers across the life sciences. So sometimes we go back to an associate editor and say, can you reconsider this? This is a nice paper. It would allow us to help broaden the scope of papers covered by the journal. And of course, as I mentioned before, we also developed a brand new section in part as a response to the rejection of some very nice papers without review, um, a section that we thought accommodated some of these papers. We also had some, an awkward situation arrive on occasion where we have solicited papers that in fact have already been submitted to and subsequently rejected by Proceedings B. The authors then write back to me, they're frustrated, they're confused, I totally understand that. Um, this, this inspired us to write a script that allowed us to avoid soliciting papers that had already been rejected. So hopefully we won't encounter that problem um, again. We also encountered problems where we solicited a paper that we had already solicited a few months before. We again turned to um, computer science. We had some of our talented uh, team members write scripts to catch repeated solicitations so that we wouldn't do that so far or anymore. So we've learned quite a bit as well along the way. First of all, the preprints on BioArchive are really high quality. People are posting papers there that are, we think, very, very often publication quality. We have learned that some authors don't want to get these emails from us. Um, as I mentioned, we've gotten some frustrated authors where the paper has been su solicited, submitted, and rejected. Um, we've gotten authors who we already solicited them. They've ignored our submission. They're tired of hearing from me and this potential perception of spam. But to counter that, I've gotten many, many, many more positive responses from authors. After I send out a batch of solicitation emails every month, and every month in response, I get often 10 plus 
um, emails back from authors saying, thank you. Uh, it's really nice to know that preprint servers are being used in this way. Um, I hadn't thought of Proceedings B and I'll think of it in the future or um, some of them have already submitted their papers to Proceedings B and the papers actually in review, which does suggest at least in many cases we're, we're making some very uh, appropriate uh, suggestions. Um, the team members, again, often early career researchers, are learning about publishing, reviewing, and preprints. They're also have, getting a very nice experience to put on their CV. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, I, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing. So thank you to ASAP Bio. Um, the biggest thanks go to the preprint team, along with uh, Proceedings B and the Royal Society for giving us this opportunity. And we'd love to connect to you on Twitter. Um, this is the Twitter handles for myself and the associate editors on the preprint team, Jarota Pachesniak and Robin Bagley. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for a really interesting presentation. I, th I think it's great the way you have this uh, framework for, for this screening, especially involving early career researchers. It sounds like a great experience. Thank you for that summary. So, as I mentioned, if there are any questions, you can post them uh, on the chat. I see there is a question, so we'll, we'll hold that until uh, we finish our second uh, presentation. So now we're moving to Tom Allenberger from Review Commons on Embo. Okay, thank you. I hope it's gonna work. <laughs> Let me uh, share my screen. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That was not successful. And it's still not successful. Let's see if I <coughs> survive at least to remain on the platform. So. That should be my screen. And now, this is better. Yep. Looking fine. I thank think you. we got it. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the little technical um, <clears throat> a glitch. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Rach and, and Jessica for inviting me to this event. It's It looks uh, quite exciting to to do this um <clears throat> type of uh, uh peer review challenge on on preprint i think it's it's a wonderful opportunity so <clears throat> my name is thomas lemberger i'm deputy head of uh, scientific publications at at embo we're located in germany uh, my background is molecular biology uh, by training and i have been uh, chief editor of one of the journals we publish molecular systems biology for for 15 years now and uh <clears throat> i recently uh, switched a little bit um to, to take over technology and, and various projects at, at EMBO. And now I'm coordinating uh, review comments, uh, which is a, a new peer review platform. So today I wanted to present a few, to, to say a few words about review comments, uh, how it works, because it's very relevant to, to the peer review process applied to, to preprint, but then maybe also uh, share some, some thoughts and <clears throat> maybe some tips. On, on how to write a peer review and, and what I feel is important in, in peer review. So uh, first review comments, review comments is a, is a peer review platform that runs the, the peer review in a journal independent way. And our goal is really to improve the, the peer review process to improve <clears throat> its, uh, its efficiency, uh, to, tr to improve the quality of the peer review and, and finally to improve the, the transparency of peer review. So how does it work? Now, this is an illustration. Authors can submit to review comments their manuscripts or their preprint. We, we prefer when they submit preprints, but they can also submit directly a, a manuscripts. And <clears throat> there is an initial editorial selection. We send uh, roughly 70% of the of the manuscript out for, for um, peer review. The manuscripts are, are peer reviewed uh, by uh, professional editors uh, at, at EMBO, uh, who use really their, their trusted network of peer review. Um, and once the, the full set of reports is, um, is returned back to the office, uh, it is uh, simply uh, transmitted to the, to the author. So review comments doesn't make any editorial decision uh, after peer review. The, the reviews are directly uh, sent to, to, the, uh, to the authors. The authors then have the possibility to post immediately 
the review on uh, alongside the, the preprint if they have one uh, and and this includes of course their response to the, to the reviews uh, such that they can represent their own point of view um, to to respond to the, the the critiques of the of the reviewers um, at the same time they can transfer the manuscript and the um, the reviews to one of 70 journals who, with whom we are working, and we are working with Embo Press journals, of course, with uh, the PLOS journals, Company of Biology, Still Life, Journal of Cell Biology, and, and Molecular Biology of the Cell. All these journals have agreed to use the peer review from review comments uh, to make their editorial decision without starting the peer review from scratch. So if the, the, the paper is not, is rejected by journal number one, the authors can go directly to journal number two uh, or to journal number three. And, and this process occurs fairly rapidly without having a new round of peer review being initiated by the journal with a new set of reviewers and so on. Um, finally, if the paper is accepted by one of the, the, the journals participating, uh, it is published <coughs> uh, online alongside the, the reviews again in the entire editorial process uh, run by the journal. So, so we, we think we improve the, and we have evidence that we improve the efficiency of peer review by eliminating the cycles of repeated uh, peer review uh, at the journal level. We increase the, the, the quality of peer review because we, we have to run this peer review in a journal independent way where the reviewers are really asked to focus only on the science, the validity of the science and, and its uh, significance, but without commenting any um, potential fit for, for journal X or, or Y or Z. And finally, the transparency is accelerated by this possibility of posting refereed preprint on, on BioArchive or MedArchive. We su support now both uh, uh, preprint servers. So it, it works. 15 journals have already accepted papers with these reviews. 98% um, <clears throat> of the published papers have not involved any additional reviews. Um, uh, and, and really uh, involved only the, the, the reviewers um, uh, initially identified and used by review comments. Of course, the journals have access to the identity of these reviewers, and we have more than 60 referee preprint now online. So this is about review comments, <clears throat> which tries really to, to run this peer review process in a, in a very generic way. And it is highly portable across a, a broad range of, of, of journals. So I think for today, um, one one important question is, you know, why do we need peer review and, and what is the goal of, of peer review? And I think it's important to clarify one's ideas about that before writing the, the review, really what, what are our goals? And I see three main goals. The first goal, of course, is to verify the, the veracity of the science in the paper um, <clears throat> and then to be constructive and try to, to strengthen the, the veracity, to make suggestions that will improve the scientific rigor of, of, a, of a study. Now, a second, call, uh, a second goal is, of course, peer reviewers, uh, reviewers, they read very carefully a study, maybe carefully than any other readers. And they are in an excellent position to make suge suggestions on how to improve the clarity of the pre presentation. It's not always easy to explain, to present data, and to, to explain reasoning uh, and, and, and conclusions. And the reviewers are really confronted to the first version, if you want, of, of a manuscript and can provide very useful feedback to improve this, uh, this clarity. And finally, a, a third goal that you may have to, to think about is um, to explain how the study advanced the field. And, and we will see why this is important when we discuss the audience of this peer review. The, the, peer, the, the reviewers can really make a, a, a good analysis of a, of a piece of work and provide really the context of this, of this piece of work and describe how it inserts itself in the body of knowledge in a given field. And this is a very important task. It's not so easy to do. Hallmarks of a good review, it has to be critical. Uh, the, this is the, really the function of, of peer review is to, to look at the science and the validity. It has to be impartial. This is not a place to defend one's own agenda, one's own own research or, 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 or preferences. It has to be argumented, so substantiated with real arguments. It is a scientific discourse between the reviewers and, and the authors. And finally, it, it should be constructive, make suggestions how to improve. At the end of the day, after peer review, 
we, we, we would like that the authors can revise their study, taking those points on board and make a better paper. Now, the audience who is going to read this paper, these, these reviews, well, of course, the authors. The, the authors are the first, is the first and prime audience of a, of a review. Uh, and therefore, the tone of the review has to be appropriate, as if you would talk directly to the, to the authors. Now, the authors are not the only um, audience, um, especially for, for public uh, reviews posted on preprint. They will be the readers, the readers of of the preprint. And these readers can be specialists who will understand all the major points and all the points of criticism on the missing control. But there will be also a lot of non-specialist readers who might not be primarily interested in all the finesse of the error bars and, and may not uh, care that much. But they will be interested in how this piece of work inserts itself in the rest of the knowledge and, and prior knowledge in, in, this, um, in this field. And finally, maybe less relevant for today, uh, but very relevant in the real life, uh, an audience uh, for the, the, the reviews are, of course, journal editors who may then consider the, the, the paper and reviews to make editorial decision on whether this preprint, on whether this manuscript can be accepted or certified as we sit uh, today. So, what is the strategy to write a, a good report? I think this is very personal. So I, I try to give here four pointers, but I, I realize that everyone has probably a different way of doing things. I think it's good to have good time man management in the context of a journal. Timely delivery is, of course, important. Now, reviewing freely uh, a preprint um, is something different. I think it's it's good to estimate the time that you will need and safely uh, multiply, multiply that by two to have a, a realistic estimate. I I would recommend to read always, always the study at least twice, once uninterrupted from the beginning to the end, to really have an overview and to understand what is the goal, what is the point of that study. It's very difficult to write a, a constructive review without actually understanding really what, what the authors want to demonstrate or, or claim to have demonstrated. So this is very important. And then I read a second time, maybe a third time and fourth time, uh, to, to have a more detailed analysis, taking notes and, 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 and look at the data, the logic, at the clarity and, and things like this. So two rounds of, of reading, having this initial overview is very useful. Then uh, I think it's important to prioritize. Prioritize what are the important points that you really want to bring across in the review that you feel are really touching the core of the message of the paper. From other points that you also note, noted during your reading and your critique, but, but that are, might be of, of lesser importance. And I think it's very important to deliver the, this message in a structured and, and clear way to the authors, such that the authors can really see what you as an expert have uh, um, uh, uh, perceived is, is important in in, um, in this paper. Finally, I think once the report is written, it's useful to read it again with in mind that that you would be the the authors receiving a report like this, and 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 really check the tone, check the argumentation, check that the the overall report, even if it's very critical, uh, remains constructive. And and, so, and 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 tries to to provide a a, a way forward. So the, you know what is the content of a, a report? Again, there is no official format. I show here a little bit the uh, the structure that we recommend in, in Review Commons, which is uh, very similar to 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 many other journals um, or many other uh, peer review services with some important difference that are due to the, the journal independent nature of review comments. So I think it's very useful to provide a summary of, of the study that really shows to the authors that the study has been read and understood or maybe misunderstood. This is a, a very good check and balance between the reviewer and the authors to say, well, this is what I understand in this study. I apologize if I'm misunderstood, but from that basis, I, I, I write the, the report. And, and then to, to do the evaluation or the analysis. And I think in, in review comments in particular, it is very important to evaluate the study as it stands and not as it could be to fit nature, cell science, embo journal or, or whatever journal to really take the, the study at face value and criticize or, or analyze and, and, and check the data that are included in the paper. Um, 
Major comments, this prioritization, major comments versus minor comments is very important. And for the major comment, they, they really touch to the key conclusion, to the core uh, conclusions of our paper, suggest uh, new experiments if necessary to demonstrate something that is really important uh, for the message, but, but rather suggest to tone down some conclusions if it's of lesser importance. Uh, the point of clarity is, of course, important. Um, are the findings and the methods described sufficiently clearly and, and, and completely to make it a, a, a piece of reproducible research. Minor comments, things that are easily uh, addressable, typos, grammar, uh, control that for sure will work, um, uh, analysis of whether the literature has been properly cited, whether there is enough context uh, provided, whether the discussion is balanced and not trying to push the interpretation on, only in one direction without considering alternatives. Now, in review comments, we, are, we ask also the reviewers to contextualize or to, to comment on the significance. And this is really the journal independent. We're not going to ask them uh, whether the, the study is well suited for, for journal A or, or journal B, but rather to try to provide this information in a very scientific uh, uh, way as, as a scientist who comes out of a, of a conference. So describe the nature and the implication of the advance for the field, what, what sort of an advance did this paper do? Uh, is it a clinical advance? Is it a constant, completely new concept? Is it a methodological advance, or new methods? Is it a, a question of uh, uh, coverage or, or accuracy and so on? They, these are many words and many ways to describe that. Um, and try to place then the work in the context of the existing literature. Uh, many, many results like these have been uh, demonstrated before on this, uh, to my knowledge, I have never seen in the literature. This is a completely novel observation, novel reasoning, novel method, and so on. And then what sort of an audience might be influenced by the reported findings? Um, is this something that, that you know, every biologist uh, on this planet should know? Is this uh, something that, uh, cell biologists who are interested in this particular uh, um, uh, uh, process will be interested, while it's probably less interesting for, for, for cancer research, for example. So this is the way we try to, to structure the, 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 the referee reports. I think there are things that one can do and should do in a, in a re review and things that one should not do. The, law, the list is very long, so here are just a, a couple of of pointers. I think it's important to articulate the points clearly in a structured way that it's understandable, immediately understandable uh, by the authors. Provide always references when commenting on novelty on prior data. Uh, not just claim this has been done 10 times, but provide at least uh, some references. Uh, I think it's very important to be also positive when there is an occasion. Uh, it's it's important to highlight the strength of a study and not only cr uh, criticize and 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 highlight the, the weaknesses. So it's also important to be to be quite supportive and and enthusiastic in a in a in a in a referee report, and of course stay uh, impartial and dispassionate. Uh, emotions usually blur the reasoning and the exchange of, of information. Uh, it is not helpful to have um, uh, reviewers who have strong positive or negative conflict of interest and who might be really biased. So, so if there is a conflict of interest, either as a collaborator or as an academic conflict from the old days, it's better not to engage in the peer review. Uh, again, uh, it is not an obligation to suggest new, obliga uh, new experiments, only if required. Uh, conclusions can be toned down. Um, there is no space for, for sarcasms or semi-sarcasms or dismissive remarks or, or, or very harsh language. And finally, uh, it has to be an exchange of argument. And, and it's, it's very difficult to, to face arguments that are sort of based on uh, global authority or what I call the infinite wisdom of the old researcher who has been 30 years in, in the field, who has, of course, a lot of experience, who knows that, that this cannot be too, but even if he knows, I think there is a duty to explain why and what are the arguments. So uh, this is for the content of the reviews. I think there is also a question of style, how the message is delivered, and we could talk a lot about that. So here, just three aspects. Uh, again, avoid uh, harsh language. Uh, this will inevitably trigger uh, emotional reaction from the authors who spend a lot of time uh, uh, doing this research. 
and I, I think it's very important. And I, I give here a, a real example um, uh, on the red box here. This manuscript is very mature and eons away from being ready. It is riddled with flaws ranging from gross ignorance to blah, blah, blah. So this was a terrible review. And I think the same substance could have been written in a non-emotional way, in a, in a, in, you know, still very critical, but not with, uh, with these uh, words that, that really hurt. Um, it is important to be specific, especially on the major point. Um, there is some risk um, of raising uh, 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 important issue in a paper by asking question, or oh, could the authors do this, or would it be possible to see ma more data points? And these questions are I, often a little bit vague. It's not exactly clear what is the scope of the answer that is that is expected by your reviewer, what is exactly missing. And it can be quite dangerous because it can be seen also as sort of an open open-ended question that may require an entire new clinical trial. So I think it's better to, to try to be as specific, to qualify what is the information missing and why is it important to provide this information. And finally, a, a, a general recommendation in this type of document is to use an impersonal style. Uh, this is to try to avoid personalizing the critique um, and to really speak about the piece of science and, and not to, to aggress uh, the, the authors and to make them feel bad because they forgot a control or maybe the, the experiment is actually um, not quite conclusive. So these are, are the, th the thoughts I wanted to share. There would be much more to say and it would be fun to, to go through some examples, good and bad. You know, I certainly recommend you to to look at real uh, review comments, uh, reviews, or also Ambo Press or on PLOS. Many journals now publish the, 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 the peer review. And I think there is no better way to learn than to download a couple of these reviews in your field, read them and, and see what you find good, what you find, don't find good, and, and, and learn from that. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Toma, for a fantastic presentation. There are so many uh, tips and uh, you know, points that we can transfer to journal review and to the review of any scientific piece. So thank you so much for that. I'm sorry it will be incredibly useful. Um, we had a question on the chat, and I also wanted to ask something, but I'll start with a, with a question on the chat, which I think was uh, probably for Maureen in relation to the selection and screen of preprints. There is a question as to whether the preprint editors, as they are screening uh, preprints, whether they check if there are any co already public comments or reviews, for example, on Papier or, or PR community in associated with that uh, preprint. That's a good question. Um, that is up to the individual preprint editorial team member, in which itself is going to be a function of the number of preprints that they are having to screen. So we do, I, I usually, I'll scroll down below the paper on BioArchive and look at the sort of Twitter about it and some of the comments, but I would say that while those, the comments and reviews are interesting and important, we don't have the time typically, unfortunately, to incorporate feedback into our process unless it's unusual. Okay, thank you. So actually this ties to the question I, I wanted to ask, which is a, a bit of a follow-up to this. Um, if we were to move to a scenario where uh, hopefully there is much more uh, activity, like what we are doing today about the, around the review of preprints, I wonder if you had any thoughts as to what would need to happen to make it easier or more useful to incorporate those reviews into a potential journal process. And um, this is for both of you. It's a great question. It's I, th I think it's a very challenging one to to handle, and we've been thinking about this in part of my role. I'm I'm both preprint editor at Proceedings B, and I'm also a regular editor. Mm -hmm. We've been talking a lot about whether to engage with some of these review services and facilitate and streamline review. I think some of the challenges are that journals really like to have I think top to down control over the review process which I can appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, there are some strengths there as well as that slows down the process. It increases the burden on the reviewers that they use. So I, I don't think that there's an obvious fix to me. Mm -hmm. Tomas, what do you? Well, I, 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 I missed the question, but. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I repeat, sorry, I was saying that if we were to move into a, a scenario where there is much more uh, reviewing of preprints, uh, and again, a lot of this is done publicly and accessible, whether, what are your thoughts as to whether and how that would be most beneficial for the journals in terms yeah. of potentially reusing some of those reviews? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, th I think there is a realization of, of many journals that the peer review system as we run it now globally is is reaching some issues of scale and so so there is interest i think there is genuine interest really from the journals to find ways to improve the the global efficiency of of the peer review and i think that was one of the motivations why so many journals sort of tried this experiment with review comments because they realize, you know, we all we all feel guilty to to receive these papers. We know they have been rejected after peer review from two journals, three journals, and we don't have access to these to these reviews. And we start again because what else could we do as a journal? So I think many journals, and, and especially the academic journals, realize that this is not reasonable, and it sort of penalizes the scientific community at large. And I think there is a sense of responsibility that we have to address that. So that's certainly one motivation. Now, it's true, you know, in terms of the content of the reviews, it was it was a challenge, and it still is a challenge with review comments to have these these reviews that are, you know, can be used by eLive, can be used by Mojournal, can be used by by Genetics. Uh, these are very different fields and different, you know, ways of thinking about it. And and I think what Maureen says. It's true, it sort of goes a little bit against this tradition that journals, you know, manage the peer review and they have their own way and they have this secret stash of reviewers. I mean, we, those of us who are since a long time in this job, we know that's a little bit of a legend. So I think the doors are opening now to more exchange, to make it more efficient. We have to find, you know, good ways that these reviews contain en enough information and we can sort of slowly catalyze this cultural change where reviewers write these reviews slightly different. It's not so different in the end of the day. Authors read the reviews also differently. You know, they have to interpret a little bit more and take more responsibility. And then, of course, uh, for editors, it is a bit of a challenge to have reviewers uh, reviews that do not say, I support for a publication for Journal X, but that sort of says what the science is. Uh, but you know, I think so. So far, it looks pretty good, uh, pretty good. So we we'll, we we'll have to see. Excellent. Thank you so much both for these uh, presentations. Uh, they were fantastic. Um, I think what we're going to do now is uh, close this area because I want to make sure there is time for the reviews. I know many of them, many of them are already working, but, which is great. But thank you everyone uh, who attended the talks and obviously thank you to Maureen and, and Thomas. It was fantastic uh, to have you here today. We'll uh, stop uh, this part, but hopefully we'll see quite a few of you at the sessions. So see you soon. Thank Bye. you.